All right, I think it's about time to get started. Thank you everyone so much for coming to the very last session of what I think has been an amazing week. Has everybody had a great week? Yeah? Excellent. Glad to hear it. So, you have come to a session about Cilium networking. Uh, was anybody at CiliumCon on Tuesday? Quite a few hands. Excellent. And uh, while you were at that, you might have heard us talking about Cilium Mesh. Yes, we have lots of meshes. So, hopefully, what I'm going to show today will clear up some of that mesh. All right. So, I think we all are familiar with the idea of Cilium connecting pods within Kubernetes cluster. And a lot of you will have come across cluster mesh, which is how we connect multiple clusters together. And we've had a few features in Cilium for quite a while, things like uh, support for external workloads. Kind of simplifying all of this into one thing that we're calling Cilium Mesh, I'm going to explain to you how really we're using some very kind of fundamental basic concepts within Kubernetes to connect workloads, whether they're in the same cluster, different clusters, or not in Kubernetes at all. So, Cilium Mesh, what are the requirements? We want to connect workloads in multiple clusters and also in non-Kubernetes environments. We want to be able to connect in public cloud and in our own premises. We want to be secure, which involves both network policies and authenticated and encrypted connections. It's a Cilium talk, so it seems traditional that we should have some Star Wars references. I'm not sure it's exactly canon, but we're basically going along the lines of Force Awakens. Right, so services and endpoints are Kubernetes concepts, and I think you're all pretty familiar with services. Maybe we should just have a quick look at what we mean when we say endpoints. So, we're going to go to Jakku, the planet Jakku, and BB-8 is going to be able to talk to the resistance service on Jakku. I don't know if you remember the storyline in The Force Awakens, but basically the resistance is the organization run by General Leia against the First Order, who are the bad guys. So, I have a kind cluster here that's called... Is that big enough? Are we all okay at the back? A bit more? Let's go with that. All right. So I have a kind cluster on Jakku, and uh, I currently have, I think BB-8 is here, yeah? And I'm going to deploy the resistance in Jakku. Oh, apply, even. <laughs> it's all live, right? You'll tell me when I do things wrong. OK. And that is going to create some pods, and we have a service, okay? And so if I exec into BB-8, I should be able to curl the resistance. Okay. And um, if we look at the pods, and we look at their IP addresses, we can see there are three pods, and they've got these IP addresses, 65, 203, 47. And if we look at the <coughs> Kubernetes endpoints, we'll see here there's a service called Resistance, and it has those three IP addresses, 203, 65, and 47. That corresponds. And we also have Cilium endpoints that represent the same, the same thing. So this is Cilium's representation of those exact same endpoints. We can see the same IP addresses there, 265, 203, 47. Okay, good. So the, uh, this is actually R2D2. If R2D2 is in the other uh, uh, cluster, which we'll go to in a moment, he can look up the resistance service and get an IP address that, res that is the same as the service, and then that gets load balanced, or that request gets load balanced to one of those 
pod endpoints. And that's a fundamental thing in Kubernetes. I haven't shown you anything new there. Cilium knows about those uh, services, and it knows about those endpoints. So I showed you the, uh, the CRD that corresponds to the endpoints. We could also exec into the Cilium pod and see the same uh, endpoint list. And they would look like this. OK, so that's just a basic connectivity inside a cluster. What do we need to do if we have multiple clusters? So the resistance base is in the planet. I think it is a planet, Dakar. And we want to be able to have a resistance service there as well. So let's go to the uh, kind cluster, which is on Dakar. And here is where R2D2 is, I'm pretty sure. And OK, a bad guy as well. <laughs> and we'll make sure there is some resistance running here uh, on Dakar. OK. And that's going to be very similar to what we just saw. Now, we have those two different clusters. One thing that's different about what I just deployed in Dakar is it's annotated to say it's a global service. And this is all you need to do in Cluster Mesh to say that your services are global. They're accessible from all of the clusters in the Cluster Mesh. I do need to go and make sure that's true in Jakku as well. So let's just uh, uncomment that. I'm going to have to go back to the other cluster. Oops. And that was back on Jakku. And we just need to reapply that resistance file. OK. So we've made a very small annotation on the service. But now, from Jakku, if BB-8, if I go back a bit, I should find eventually. There we go. If BB-8 sends a message to the resistance, sometimes he's going to get a response from the resistance on the base in, Jak in Dakar. And sometimes it will come from, hopefully, eventually, yes, the original message that we saw on Jakku. So that service is accessible from either cluster, but we, they're just services still. What about the endpoints? Well, let's look at the service first on Jakku. The service looks exactly the same. It's called resistance. Let's look at the endpoints. So from Kubernetes' point of view, it's still only got these three endpoints. And those three are running in Jakku. That seems a little bit strange. Let's look at the Cilium endpoints. OK. That also still only has the three endpoints. What's going on? Let's have a look at the, uh, what's happening inside the pod, uh, inside the Cilium pod, Cilium agent. So that's the name of this agent. I hope I've actually applied that correctly. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to exec into the Cilium pod. And we can run commands directly on Cilium here. And let's look at the service list from inside the agent. OK. Here, this is, we can just check that this is the right service that I'm looking at. So the service for the resistance end in 64, that corresponds to this here. But from the Cilium agent's point of view, we've actually got six endpoints. And three of them have this at two, which is the second cluster in the cluster mesh. So it's a very simple change from Cilium's point of view. These are just IP addresses that have to be reachable. So BB-8 on Jakku is able to reach the service in either location. If we went to Dakar, we could actually change things to have local service affinity. So I'm going to go back to the planet Dakar, kind Dakar. And this is where R2D2 is hanging out. And I need to just reapply this change that I've just made so that it's local affinity. 
resistance car. And now what that's going to mean is if RTD2 asks for assistance from the resistance, we're going to prefer getting a response from the local cluster. So let's do that. RTD2, car the resistance. These should always say that they come from the base on the car. And however many times we do this, we'll never get load balance to the service on Jakku. So we have this ability to load balance across multiple clusters or to prefer local services. We could also prefer remote services, which could be really handy if we're trying to uh, turn down the service on the local cluster in favor of moving to a different cluster. OK. So from Cilium's point of view, they're just endpoints. Really simple. We don't need any sort of special abstraction to understand how to load balance to these endpoints that are not within the local cluster. And we can extend that to environments outside of Kubernetes. All we really need is an IP address that we can route to. So, I don't know if you remember, at the end of the, uh, the Force Awakens, we find that Luke Skywalker has been hanging out on the planet Act2. And Act2 is not a cluster. He's pretty isolated. It's a VM all on its own. OK, so uh, let's see, Act2. If I look at my uh, Docker containers, we can see there's the Dakar cluster. There's the Jakku cluster. I have a local registry. And here is a VM. This is where Luke is hanging out. OK, so how can we communicate with Luke? R2 actually knows how to communicate to Luke. So what we need is an endpoint on the, uh, in Dakar that just happens to be external to the cluster. So I need to let's go back here. Make sure I'm in the right context. I am in Dakar. And this is what I need to do. I'm going to add an end. I need to actually run this inside the Cilium pod. So let me just get the pod. Ex execute into there. Um, copied that too soon. So this IP address here, the 172.19.100.2, that's the VM Act 2. So, okay, so that's created an endpoint. And if we look at those endpoints, they're quite hard to read because there's, there's a lot of text going to come out here, but uh, we should be able to see uh, somewhere up here. We'll find, there it is. There's our Jedi Luke, who happens to be hanging out at this IP address. R2D2 can't route directly to that, so he needs a service. We need a service. We're not going to have a pod. There's just going to be a service that we're going to deploy. So, come on. There we go. We're going to apply Luke. OK, so now we've got a service called Luke. And that should mean that if we exec into R2D2, We should be able to reach Luke. There we go. Great. So we've been able to get a response from that workload that happens to be running in a VM. And all we had to do was make sure there was an endpoint associated with that VM's IP address. OK, and here's the slide version for if it didn't work and the, uh, if the demo gods weren't smiling on us. <laughs> so we've basically just got a service with an IP address, and that IP address corresponds to 
and entering the service list. In fact, we could just look at that. Let's just make sure. So let's get the Cilium pod again. And exec into that again. And we should be able to see service list. That, there's our service that corresponds to Luke right at the end there. And it's load balancing to one endpoint, which is the VM. OK. That could be really useful if you wanted to connect to a workload that's external. But what if you want to then migrate that workload from its VM? You turn it into a containerized workload, and you want to start running it under Kubernetes. We could actually do something like this, where we also deploy it as a pod, and we can start load balancing between the VM and the pod, because it's just an endpoint. It doesn't matter from the service perspective or from Cilium's perspective. It's just an IP address. So let's do that. We have here a Jedi pod, which is basically Luke. He's going to say something slightly different this time if we uh, deploy that. Just make sure I'm in the right. Yes. So Jedi YAML. So hopefully now, if we are RTD2 and we talk to Luke, we sometimes see the message from the local pod and sometimes see the message from the VM. It's going to show me lots of it. There we go. So we've got load balancing between a workload on the VM and a, the same a pod running the equivalent service locally in the cluster. One of the really nice things about doing this with Cilium is that we can protect those uh, flows, the network flows between workloads, whether they're external or within clusters, locally or remotely, using network policies. Because the network policy doesn't care whether the, the, the IP address, whether that endpoint is local or remote. It just knows it as an endpoint, and the policy either applies or doesn't. So we could do something like this, where we ensure that only resistance traffic can flow to, that, uh, to those endpoints. So let's apply. I've got a cluster-wide network policy that we can apply. And that's going to make sure that only resistance containers will be able to communicate with Luke. So if I am, so I'll just show you that I have both uh, Kylo and R2D2 here. And if I am acting as R2D2, you've already seen this. Um, we should be able to speak to Luke. It's all working fine. But if I am a member of the first order, as Kylo Ren is, then that's just going to hang because the packet's being dropped due to network policy. OK, so now I'm going to turn to a different demo that's been set up by Martinez, my colleague Martinez. Uh, where he's actually got this running in uh, partly in Google Cloud and partly in AWS, and using this exact same uh, kind of endpoint feature to have client VMs on one side of what we're calling a mesh tunnel and a workload, an Nginx pod, running in a completely different cloud. So let's see if we can see this working. OK. So here are my what's running in GCP. We can see an Nginx service. And I've got also uh, AWS. And if I look at the services there, we can see, again, an Nginx service there. But what we're going to do, we're going to uh, communicate from Google Cloud via this transit VM to the uh, AWS cluster. 
So we can't go directly from these VMs, or we can't go directly to this Kubernetes cluster. We're going to go via this VM. And so that means that because this, uh, the transit one is on Google Cloud, we're going to use the service address on Google Cloud from these two different clients. So that should mean, here's, here's one of those VMs called Good Client. Let me just get that IP address, sorry. That's Google Cloud. No, it isn't, that's AWS. This one's Google Cloud. So I should be able to get an Nginx response from that address, and we do. Whereas if I go to the bad client and make the same request, that's timing out. And again, that's because of network policy. And we can also see that, if I find the right screen, yeah, we can see that in Hubble, Hubble UI. And yeah, there we go. So we can see on the left here, it might be a little bit small, let's try and make that a bit bigger. We can see uh, some traffic from the good VM and the bad VM They're disappearing quite quickly now. I've made it. So we can see the packets being dropped from the bad VM. OK. That was amazing. The demos all worked. Nothing broke. <laughs> All right, so something that I haven't shown you there is this idea of authentication and encryption. And I'll be honest, that is not quite ready to demo, but we're making a lot of really good progress here. You may well have seen us talking about this next generation mutual authentication and encryption. And what's happening here is we use an identity management system, Spiffy is gonna be the first integration here, to get identities for the workloads that are going to communicate. And those might be services inside the cluster. They could be external services. It doesn't really matter, because again, it's just about having an identity that we can associate with the endpoints that back up a service. So we have these uh, certificates. We do a handshake at the start of the connection. And then we can use that to, to um, establish authentication, inject the, the subsequent certificates into the kernel so that we can use that for encrypting the traffic between those workloads. Doesn't matter whether they're in cluster or out of cluster. You may have seen us talking about this in the context of service mesh, but it's useful for so many other scenarios as well. So, that's coming along quite nicely. The data path part of that is already in Cilium 1.13, and there's more work afoot on the uh, kind of configuration side, the control plane side, if you like. What's going to be really nice about this is you can specify the requirements for authentication and encryption as part of the network policy. So again, it's, we're not having to create a whole load of new abstractions. We can use the existing abstractions, but extend them to say, not only am I going to allow traffic between these endpoints and those endpoints, but I'm going to require that communication to be authenticated and optionally encrypted. We do have users who actually want it to be authenticated, but not necessarily paying the encryption cost. So that's another nice feature about this next-gen approach, being able to independently have the uh, encryption, or optionally have the encryption, I should say. The last thing that you may want to, well, the last thing that I'm gonna speak about that you might want to do in terms of connecting to external workloads is the idea of advertising those services over BGP networks. So your clusters could be very distributed and using BGP to communicate between them. So, for example, when any member of the resistance wants to go to the cantina in Takodena, they probably have to use BGP to get there. So, wrapping up pretty quickly today, but then I guess that means we'll have time for either questions or you get to go home. <laughs> 
Wrapping up, what do we have? We have the ability to connect workloads. We've always had the ability to connect workloads with Cilium, but now those workloads could be in any Kubernetes cluster or in any non-Kubernetes environment, so long as we have an IP address that we can reach them through. That could be IPv4, it could be IPv6. That could be in your choice of public cloud. It could be in an on-prem environment. You've seen GCP and AWS there um, communicating using Cilium Mesh. All secured with network policies, and the work is coming along very nicely to use that next-gen MTLS to provide the authentication handshake and the encryption between those workloads. Thank you very much. I've actually, did anybody manage to pick up some books, either my book or Natalia's book, over the, over the course of the week? Excellent, good. If you didn't manage to pick up a, a physical copy of the books today, you can download them from isavalent.com, and that'll give you some insights into the eBPF technology that underpins Cilium. The other thing I'll mention on this slide is isovalent.com slash labs, where there are a lot of really great sandboxed labs tutorials that can walk you through things like the BGP connections that I didn't have time to show you today, uh, and many, many other aspects of Cilium. So with that, thank you very much, and I hope you've had a wonderful KeepCon. <laughs>And I guess there is time for some questions if anybody has some. I don't know how we're supposed to do with them. Oh, apparently there's microphones in the, on the two sides. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, you uh, are. Yeah. So my question goes uh, regarding connecting to external service. So you should, you have to create an endpoint using Cilium. Is it possible to do it a native way with Kubernetes endpoints? I'm going to say yes, yes and no. So there's the concept of an external workload where you might run a Cilium agent co-located with that workload, in which case, yes. What I did there, yeah, I, I configured it manually, and I think that probably uh, speaks to the Experiment, experimental nature of this. There, there will need to be some control plane to configure these endpoints in a more usable fashion. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, supposing you have a service that is redundantly served by two different clusters to the external world, let's say you want to expose these, those such services through ingresses in either cluster. Mm -hmm. Uh, could the, the ingresses in either cluster connect uh, uh, seamlessly to the back-end services in, in, in both of them? Yes, they could. Um, I'm pretty sure we have a blog post, an isovalent blog post, that shows exactly that, because I'm pretty sure I saw the diagram in the last few days, and it has exactly that, two different ingresses into two different clusters, and then kind of backed by... Should Global the ingresses services. be Cilium ingresses or could be any ingress? Is it transparent to the ingress? Yes, transparent to the ingress. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, just to expand on that, from the ingress's point of view, it's just talking to a service. So it doesn't matter what the ingress is, it's just a, a service underneath. Again, Kubernetes kind of fundamental concepts here. So thanks for the presentation, uh, really good stuff. In the demo where you were setting, setting up the uh, endpoint for look outside of the cluster and you had to set up a service as well, can this service be a headless one or it should be a cluster IP service? Uh, it could be headless, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, don't think it matters. Dep I mean, depends how you're gonna address that service, but yeah. I mean, what, uh, like what we have tested before uh, with, the, um, uh, with the Cilium service mesh, uh, it, it wasn't able to support uh, services like to you know, split traffic and load balance between different uh, 
ports behind the service between different services when they are uh, when the service in front of them is headless. So I'm surprised by that. I'm 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 not going to say I've tried it myself. So I I'm not. It seems a little surprising, but we can take that offline and figure out if there's a reason for that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> One over here. So for the example with uh, Luke that was in outside in a VM, I assume that in that example, the pods could directly talk to that IP of the VM of Luke without even introducing the, the service? No, it was going via the service. So... Um, but the IP was not directly routable to, because rather there was nothing running in the VM of Luke, right? So in the VM of Luke, it's just the... So we're, we're, we're trying to get to the... I wonder if I can find the diagram. Do, 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 do. Yeah, no, let's go to the one where it's just here. So Luke has... Luke's VM, or the app to VM, has an IP address. We put in place a service so that R2-D2 could address the, I mean, use DNS to look up the IP address of the service, and then the service was backed by the endpoint that happened to be external. Okay, so the question is that if R2-D2 know beforehand the IP, it could connect, right? Oh, I see. If he, if he knew directly the... Yes. yes. Um, if it's routable from, yeah. Because we don't create anything special, uh, the VMs of the cluster or nodes are have routes to that. Yeah, VM if them. it's if it's routable from that so now network, the which they is, are here. And yeah. so the follow-up is: Could we do something that uh, the port of the service of Luke is not open, so it's not reachable directly, if even if you know the IP? So um, somehow an, another CUM agent mm. in the VM of Luke advertises routes. But it's not a Kubernetes cluster. Would that be possible? I could have an agent inside the Lux VM to to join the network of yeah. the cluster. Yeah. Yeah. So you could. Uh, I mean, another approach would be, and and we do have this in in the external workloads um, approach, is to have a kind of uh, a Kubernetes cluster running, but without the workloads necessarily being pods. Okay. Like, you know, there could be like host network okay. accessible addresses. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. So uh, is the Cilium Mesh a uh, new feature or is the name for all of these features you were presenting? <laughs> That's a really great question. Uh, I think we are experimenting with that name and seeing whether it, I, th I think of it as covering the whole thing because that's what Cilium should be about. should be about connecting all your workloads without you having to think too hard about exactly what the mechanism is between them. Um, in order to implement what we're calling Cilium Mesh, we're having to, you know, th there is a little bit of change in the ability to add those endpoints and, um, you know, still work in progress around the kind of control plane for those external endpoints. Um, but yeah, to my mind, mesh is the whole thing. But we'll, we'll see what, what settles. <laughs> Thank you.